welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, I'm with Ariel from Asherah's, Asherah's Orchard. Let me just share my screen for a quick second. And uh, go and subscribe to my buddy Ariel, Ariel Rosenberg. He just started a new channel. Help him out. Get him some subscribers. Check out some of the videos he's got up already. And, uh, yeah, and you're going to get into some of this stuff. You're going to school as well, I believe, for some of these religious topics, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm double majoring in anthropology and religious studies at Arizona State University. And I I'm, I should finish up with my undergrad degree in probably a year and a half if everything goes according to plan. And then after that, uh, I mean, honestly, I don't really know exactly what I have in store, but I probably want to go to, like, post-grad at some point. I just don't know if it'll be right away. But sure. I think more than anything, I just, I like being a communicator for like these ideas to, because I mean, even within like my own community, within the Jewish community, I feel like there's so much of this stuff that's kind of just, it, it's almost like it's left under the surface. And it's not because it's like hidden or anything. It's just, you need to engage with it. And all too often, the only people that engage with these texts are religious people or well, what, what most people would see is like fundamentally religious. And the thing is, if that's sure. the standard that you set for yourself, you know, you're never going to get into this because you're like, well, this isn't interesting to me because, you know, even if you don't believe in anything, which I actually, you know, I, I have maybe a bit of an unorthodox belief, you know, relative to Judaism, but like, I still believe in God. And that's like more than I could say in the past. But I, I can say that before I had that possibility or like that, you know, ability to hold a transcendent worldview. I had no interest in the Bible. And like, yeah. you, you know, it was, to me, it was just fairy tales. And the thing is, like, I, I think part of the thing is that regardless of what you believe about, you know, the miracles in the Bible, there's a lot of history. And obviously it's heavily mythologized, heavily fictionalized, but that doesn't mean that it's not real. Like um, the idea that, you know, history is objective i mean even today is untrue but it's something that you know in the past like you just look at herodotus's accounts sure like they're, they're heavily mythologized you can't oh yeah them at face Herod value. herodotus is talking about in the north in the land of the hyperboreans they have gold guarding griffins and there's people with one eye and some of the men don't even have heads their heads are on their torsos so he's making shit up he's yeah so that was kind of the norm in the ancient world. You make stories, pass them down, and you have not you uh, you and I have even talked because you're not you're not a you know a hostile witness to Judaism. You're you take a critical approach, even though you are a practicing Jew who you know observes Shabbat and stuff like that. But you also have are not scared to look into these things, and you have you have even admitted to me many times like. Some of these stories look like they're coming from the Babylonians, Sumerians, and maybe even Egyptians, but it doesn't make it not real in the sense that Israel is personifying them and making it about their history and sort of, you know, maybe sometimes even polemicizing the old versions and making their. So I get what you're saying by that, but that's why I like having you on. I like getting your approach. You have a really good approach to this. And so, you know, you can't say I'm just a biased atheist agnostic that's trying to debunk all this stuff. I'm just trying to learn what the sources are where this stuff comes from and get to the, you know, get into the nitty gritty. And I think you do a good job of helping me do that, even though you you have a different belief than me, you have a different approach than me, but it's really helpful to have you on here with me. So, yeah. Thanks. And yeah, like, um, actually, I think this was last night though, uh, because I, I got COVID a few days ago, I'm kind of, everything's jumbled together, but, um, actually, yeah, it was last night. Um, there was a live stream going on. It, it was the funniest thing because it was like, I mean, not that heated, but just like you, you could tell, like it, it was contentious despite not being like, you know, directly like, oh, you know, screw you or whatever. But it was a debate between two Christians, one who is, uh, it was, a uh, between power word, uh, who I, I think he's just like, um, someone who listens to, uh, EA Dawa sometimes. And then sentinel apologetics i forget if you've ever had him on um yeah but, i know who he is but i don't think i've had no not he hasn't been on this channel but i know who you're talking about but yeah so he um so they, they were debating about the age of the earth and like I, I tended to fall in a lot more with what sentinel was saying because i mean it was based in you know in the hebrew but 
what, what I found interesting was um, this idea that some people were disagreeing with. Um, basically, if you have, for instance, the flood story in other traditions, and it's not this, like, does that somehow mean that it's fictional? I mean, like, on one hand, like, yeah, it could be. But the thing is, I'd actually argue that the fact that it presents itself in so many cultures is indicative of some underlying kernel of truth. Do you think, that there's, than, do you think there's local floods happening and people are, you know, telling this story and stuff like that? I mean, like, we, we know for sure there were local floods, but then yeah. it goes into, like, you sure. know, whether there was a global flood. And, you know, then there's this idea of possibly a preserved memory of the Younger Dryas event. But, like, at, at the end of the day, I just think it's interesting because... I wouldn't because, go there, but sure. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, no, I get I, what you're saying, though. I get what you're saying. You're saying there's something there to be said. There's something there to look at. There's a reason why these are sacred stories being passed down. It's not just mumbo jumbo. There's something there... And let's look into it. I get what you're saying. I mean, it's not even like they, they could be, you know, they could be made up. But the, the point more is that the fact that you have these stories throughout, you know, every civilization, more or less, that that's indicative of something, whether that's indicative of this event that actually happened or that it's indicative of possibly some sort of psychological process like that or, you know, yeah. some sort of motif, like kind of under a more Jungian approach. Yeah, like, you know, there's so many ways you could approach it. Interesting. So, yeah, that's that's a good good part. So, the topic of today, though, that I want to get into, twelve tribes. Why is it twelve? Are they are they based on historical, real twelve tribes? And I know you've been looking at this critically recently, and you brought it to my attention that we should. This is some there's some interesting stuff happening here. Um, let's get right into it. What do you got for us that you want to present? as far as the origin of these 12 tribes. And then I well, like, I know you were, you were talking about earlier how this, some, there might be some, some Greek stuff happening here with some of these tribes, like the tribe of Dan, for example, getting into Egypt coming from the North and then sort of like mixing in with the crowds of Hyksos or later on Israelites, but let's get into this. So what do you got for us? Yeah. Uh, give me one second. I just need to pull up the right verse. Um, sure. But yeah, so maybe just continue with a bit of context as to like what you're okay. talking about. For so those what I'm us. talking, what I'm actually talking about, when there's alternative histories given by Roman historians. For example, the the most prolific of all of them is Tacitus. I'll even share my screen to show you what I'm talking about. Tacitus has this. It's 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 in his, it's in Tacitus's histories in book five, where he gives this completely alternative history of the Jews that is not to be found anywhere else in the Old Testament. It's completely separate. And he says right here, for example, as I'm about to relate the last days of a famous city, it seems appropriate to throw some light on its origin. Some say the Jews are fugitives from the island of Crete, who settled on the nearest coast of Africa about the time when Saturn was driven from his throne by the power of Jupiter. Evidence of this is sought in the name. There is a famous mountain in Crete called Ida. The neighboring tribe, the Idea, came to be called Judea by barbarous lengthening of the national name. Now, I know some scholars have saw, have read that part and said, I don't know about Tacitus here. I don't think he's right about that. But if you continue with what he's saying, if you just you know put that to the side for a second, he talks about how there's a people who go into Egypt and they assimilate with the Egyptians, but they also, you know, they also bring their storm god, whoever their storm god is, and then, he, you know, so a lot of times when you assimilate your gods to a new culture, you take on the attributes, but you take on the name of the local god. So, you know, Zeus might become Typhon or Set or, you know, Baal or something because they all have the same attributes. They're all storm gods, but they just sort of go with, the, with you know, what the norm is. And so basically what happened was the Oracle of Amon, after these events happened where there was, you know, so supposedly there was, uh, natural disasters happening and they didn't know who to blame. So the Oracle of Amon said it's the it's these it's these Hyksos. They're the ones to blame. And uh, so, you know, kick them out of Egypt. And so what I think ends up happening and that Tacitus Tacitus talks about this. And so does Barosis, the Chaldean. And um, they talk about how the Hyksos, they well, they'll they'll say the Hyksos are the Jews. But what I think they're actually saying and what I think what they actually mean is the Hicksaw story 
gets personalized by the Jews later on. And they they sort of claim the story as their own. And then they heavily mythologize it. This is just me. I'm not giving you from any scholar. It's just my personal opinion. I think that the story of the Hyksos gets allegorized and told in a different light as the Israelites exodus. And so I think that all the stuff that you get in the Old Testament of the Israelites exodus is sort of, you know, glorifying the past and sort of saying, okay, the Hyksos, when they got kicked out of Egypt, you know, they went to the north and settled here. And then they got their independence from the Egyptians who had dominion over all these lands, all the way up to the Hittites, all the way up to the Babylonians. And then this became Israel. And that's the story. That's what I think. So I love to hear your thought. And then the 12 tribes thing, I think, I think it's simple. I think they're overlaying. I don't think there's exactly 12 tribes. Maybe there's more, maybe there's less. I have no idea. But I think they're going to make the number 12 because there's, there's that Platonic idea. I'm not saying that they're Platonists, but they're probably have a similar similar idea as this. The Platonic idea is as above, so below. Everything that's in heaven is also on earth. There's different forms. There's the highest forms in heaven, the lowest forms on earth. So I think that what they're doing is they're, they're uh, overlaying the 12 constellations onto their 12 tribes and saying that there are 12 tribes, even though based off the the uh, universal concept of the 12 constellations, what you see in Babylonian, Egyptian, Greek, even Indian, like all over the world, this 12, this, this concept of the 12 constellations, it's, it's universal. It goes all the way back to the Sumerians and it stays universal up until right now. So that's, that's my, that's my theory, but let's, let's, let's hear you. Let's hear what you think about that. So, so yeah, I'm, um, I'm actually, um, streaming. Yeah. Or, oh yeah. In, I think, I think, I think you got the wrong one on, I think. Oh no, <laughs> okay, no, no. It's, I'm, yeah. Okay. So here, uh, oh shoot. I opened two of these. All right. So here's what, uh, wait, where is it? So if you look at this, uh, let me see if I can zoom in. So, um, according to, you know, the whole, uh, Joshua narrative of conquest, we're supposed to understand that, you know, that um, the Israelites came in from outside the land, basically killed everyone, took over the land and inhabited it in their place. And so, I mean, based off of like archaeological evidence, there's nothing backing that up, which um, one of the theories, I forget who came up with this. I'm really bad with details, good with concepts. But um, there's basically a theory that it was not a conquest of, you know, people group versus people group, but rather more of like a political or a cultural one, because you already had this idea that like the, um, was it when the Israelites went down into Egypt, they were seen as Canaanites. And um, I, I don't have the exact reference, but it, it's definitely a thing. Uh, th th they were seen as Canaanites. And so- sure. Um, so ba basically, oh shoot, where was I going with this? Sorry, COVID brain. Um, ba basically, so you have this group possibly, pro I mean, in the narrative, it's the, all the Israelites, but possibly just one group of Israelites that goes off into Egypt. You still have, you know, um, Israelites possibly, according to the theory that I buy into that, um, the Exodus was probably the, um, the Egyptian empire exiting their like their hold over um over the land of canaan which later became known as the land of israel uh basically that the exodus is like this whole concept of when um when israel or when egypt wait when israel was in egypt it's possible that you know in the same way that texas is in america <clears throat> sorry texas yeah. is in america absolutely and and you look at the maps of the, you know, the, the, you know, the modern map makings of when we look at the dominions that the Egyptians claimed, they had dominions going all the way up through Israel, all the way up to modern day Syria. That was part of Egypt. Even the culture early on, like we look at the stone of the, the Hezekiah. I think I have it right here somewhere. No, I don't. But the, the stone that we have that goes back to the time of Hezekiah, there's Egyptian ox on it. So the culture was even still going on, even after the long after the so-called exodus or whatever you want to call it there's there's that you know what i mean there's definitely that so i think some people go too far with it though you get people who think that's it's all egyptian 
they don't they don't do any work in linguistics because the Semitic language is coming from Babylon Sumer. You know, that's the Semitic world. So it's not just that they're just Egyptians, but they're sort of a cultural mix. And it look, makes sense for, for where you look at the, where they're located. They're right in the middle of everything. So, um, yeah, so kind of going on that point, I, I think that if you look at it as in the same way as you have when, uh, when, when some of the Judeans were exiled to Babylon, not all of them were. But you have this narrative that gets written from the point of view of the Babylonian Jews, you know, not that they're any different other than they were exiled to Babylon, you know, they're si not that it would really matter, but they're still the same, you know, genetic Jews, as problematic as that term is, like, you know, this isn't just some group of Babylonians that are suddenly practicing Judaism. These are Jews that have been exiled to Babylon. Sure. And then when they return they see stuff that because they'd been basically um, they'd been steeped in this culture that they see, see as very pagan. And so a lot of their practices are built around avoiding that. So then they go back to their land where, you know, they had maybe more indigenous practices that were still seen as pagan or, or that would be seen as pagan, but right. because they were indigenous, there was no problem with that. They, they go back into this society and they see it as pagan because they have basically uh, they've like, you know, battened down the hatches and they've said, you know, we're getting rid of all this stuff that could be even considered pagan because we don't want to be associated with these people. Right. It, it's similar how um, there were uh, rabbis who didn't want uh, the menorah lighting or the Hanukkah lighting for Hanukkah to be associated with Zoroastrianism. And so they deliberately said, you have to light them individually. You can't light them like as one job. You, you know, you can't just wow. like light them. Like, That's the fire. eternal fire of Asha. Yeah. Oh, but, one uh, second. You're right. Yeah. Sorry. It was just, uh, um, just, a you know, doorbell jingle. Uh, so so yeah. yeah, let's get into the 12 tribes thing. Where do you think, where does the number come from? Do we have evidence of there actually being tribes? What do you, what have you found from, because I know you do a lot of Talmud reading. You do a lot of, you going into sources. What, what do you got for us as far as that? Well, well just to start off, I, I wanted to point out, if you look at this allotment of land, yeah. um, I want, I want to point out a few things. So first of all, you have Judah, and, um, you, have, you have Simeon or Shimon in like the land that's, Basically, it's like inside of Judah. Sure. Um, on top of that, you have Benjamin, uh, like right on the outskirts of uh, Judah. You have um, so so that's basically um, like th those are the tribes that would be in the you know the kingdom of Judah, and then all the other tribes were part of the northern kingdom. And yeah. So, can I just jump in real quick? Oh yeah, yeah. I noticed this is always this has always confused me. Even right now, I'm still confused about this. Levi was one of the tribes, according to the to the, to the uh, Genesis. But Levi is just, they're just running the temple. They're basically inside of Judah, but they have no allotment in the map. And this is also described in Exodus. Levi doesn't get any lands. They just get the temple. But doesn't that make 13? So there's, I mean, depending on how you count it, 13, possibly even more, as we'll get into in a bit. But so Levi, they didn't just have, well, so they didn't have any land. They were basically, for lack of a better term, I mean, it's probably not the best comparison, but they were the Jews of the Jews. They, they weren't allowed to own land. They basically had to, uh, you know, they had to administer the temple. Um, but on top of that, they, um, they had like roles as, um, well, so the, the, the Kohanim, the priests, were like in the narrative from the uh, from the tribe of Levi, but the interesting thing is that I think that like it might be this context of like the the um, the Levitical priests as opposed to this possibly older idea of like um, essentially the king priests or like um, this concepts of like uh, like kings of righteousness Melchizedek. Or, or which I argue it might actually be Malkate Sedek, the kings of righteousness, as opposed right. to um, my king is righteous. But th th that's a story for another time. What I think is really interesting about this, though, oh, wait, shoot, where was I going with this? Um, ah, dang it, what, what are we just talking about? You're talking about the Levi and the. Oh, right. Yeah. 
So, so they were actually tasked with administering to people all throughout the land. And uh, like before the, um, before the, um, the temple was actually constructed, they were responsible with going throughout the land and collecting the taxes for the, te you know, temple for, for like the, um, the tent like, basically. Yeah. Cause they and still so, had a tent before the temple. Yeah. And this is the interesting thing. They didn't just have, well, so there, there's the narrative of, you know, the tabernacle that, that was moved from, you know, place to place, but there were actually multiple shrines that were later destroyed in the time of, I think it was King Hezekiah. Um, but some of them were even um, said to be constructed by Abraham. So you, like you have this idea of things that previously were okay, suddenly aren't okay. So either they weren't okay in the first place or they suddenly don't become okay, or it's how people are using them. But I think it's at the end of the day, I think it's narrative, sure. but yeah, anyway, to the relevant or to, like, you know, to continue, uh, to continue, if you look at, um, for instance, the land of Reuben, um, yeah. They they have um like they're right above Moab, um, yeah. S same with Gad, like they're across the Jordan. That would be like the Qumran region, wouldn't it? Uh, I think so. No. Might be a little bit north of that, but yeah. I, I think no. Uh, you went to Qumran, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. No, no. So it's not there. Because it'd the, be down the, more. It'd be down. I said that's why I said it's a little. It's a little bit more than north, but it, Qumran would be down more. Oh, here. L l let me switch so that you can see where. So it's not a big deal. You can just. <laughs> So, so Ruben's here, but th this is in modern day Jordan. Right, right. W were you there? Yeah, we went through there. Oh, cool. I mean, well, it's off the Dead Sea, so it is in that region, but it's well, probably not on the exact same side. No, no. So Qumran is around here. Right. And then Ruben is over here on the other side of. Gotcha, the gotcha. That makes sense. And so, what, what's interesting here? Um, I'll, I'll see if I can pull it up later. Like, you, you know, when you're talking, and I have. Um, but th there's this one reference to Kamosh God, the God of the Moabites, which is kind of interesting because it seems like there's almost this, I don't know the, it's probably connecting the, the Canaanite deity God to Kamosh. But I also have to wonder, is it saying the God Kamosh of God? In which case, like, is there maybe a connection between Reuben and God and Moab and Amon? Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't have anything to go on that other than they're like right in that same area. Yeah. But if the theory of basically just changing culturally rather than being slaughtered and replaced by a new population is correct, then it stands to reason that essentially these tribes are just former nations that eventually get considered as one group of people because of being ruled by, you know, uh, kings and so that kingdom they need to create a, essentially whether you view it as you know they're just piecing together their individual histories or that they're creating a fictive history at the end of the day they're 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 binding them themselves together with a shared story yeah so okay go ahead i was gonna say something but I'll keep going oh, oh no 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 you, you go i was gonna say so when we get the number so is there now the question is is there do you think there's a lot more than 12 tribes and they're just kind of con consolidating them into smaller groups to get that number is that what you think is happening here because that would make because honestly when i think about it a tribe wouldn't cover that much region in the ancient world a tribe would just cover like a city state region a small area so i would think there might be more than 12 tribes and they're all sort of in the same cultural milieu, worshiping the same God, sort of participating in the same religion, had the same, you know, same language and stuff like that. And then what I have maybe later on, they consolidate and make 12 out of it. Possibly. What do you so think? Um, now, so this I, is the oldest. This is the oldest Stella in the world that mentions Israel, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. Mesha Stella? Another thing that's interesting is so this name Mesha. Uh, let me see if it actually has the, uh, it probably doesn't. Um, but the, the root for Mesha, it's actually from the same root as Yehoshua. And it means like to save or to rescue. And so Mesha means, wow. it basically means savior. Yeah. So, I've, heard, I've heard someone say that the Mesha can mean savior too. Yeah. So let me see where, where does it actually give the text? Um, okay, so it describes how Moab was oppressed by King Omri of Israel and his son as a result 
of the anger of the god Kamosh. Mesh's victories over. Can you make that a little bigger if you don't mind? If you, oh, just, it's really yeah. small. Um, Mesh's victories over Omri son not named, and the men of God at Atarot, Nebo. And so, another interesting thing Nebo, the, the name of the mountain where Moses, the lawgiver, was buried, was Har Nebo. Yeah. And that's a cognate with the. Uh, and Gad is the name of a god, too. Yeah. God, god, Gad is the god of luck. He's like Fortuna in the Romans. So, and the. Oh, this is interesting. His wars against the Horonaim, that be, because that's also derived from Choron, which is the um, Canaanite name right. for Hades. But for, think about it like this, for example. We go back far enough, we're getting the polytheism, Canaanite world. There could be local gods, like Gad maybe, becoming a local tribe. And I'm just throwing it out there. A lot of these tribe names look like some of the names of the gods in the ancient pantheon of Canaanites. Maybe I should pull that up, the Canaanite Pantheon. We can look at it. You know? Okay, so, so the thing that I was talking about, um, so th uh, this is a um, footnote. Um, this reading of Mesha's father's name, quoted here for copyright reasons, is no longer accepted in light of the El Karak inscription. The common reading is now Kemosh Yat. Um, Kemosh Yat, according to H.L. Ginsburg, the second element might be vocalized Yati, short for Yatin, Oh, who gives, uh, yeah. like Yaten, uh, a conjunction of Northwest Semitic Yaten from Proto-Semitic Watan to give. A well-known derivative is Natan, and that's like na um, Natan or Natanel, where we get Nathan and Nathaniel from. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. So, um, so no, so God and um, the Moabites were enemies. So scratch sure. that. I mean, again, it's possible that, you know, you have a group here. It's like, oh, we're enemies with this group. And actually you're very similar to them. But did I know. just, oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. But I was going to oh, say no, this. No. I was going to say this on a tab, but it popped right up. But since it's on the screen now, the Canaanite religion, this is, I'm obviously using Wikipedia. So, you know, just bear with me. I'm not, I don't have like a, I'm not really looking at the good sources right now, but let's just, just, let's just go with it. Let's just assume that Wikipedia has got some good, good information on the names of some of these gods from the Levant. You have L, okay. Everyone knows what that is. That's God, but then you also have uh, Shatan. You know, it makes you wonder: Is this where the Satan character comes from? Baal, right. Astarte, Asherah. Um, you know, Baal Hermon was a god of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is super central to the, the Old Testament. And then you have so you have, you know what I'm saying? You have a lot of Gad, god of fortune. That's the name of one of the twelve tribes. Um, I don't know. I don't see any other name. Then you, then you have Siddiq, God of Righteousness or Justice. It makes you wonder: is the is the the Levite tribe known as the Sadducees? Are this is this a priesthood that comes out of this God? Maybe I'm just throwing I, hypotheses out there, but I, it's I interesting. I don't think so because of the reason that you have this like, um, like was it? So you have the you know the Sadducees and the Pharisees, which are, you know, part of like the, uh, Levitical priesthood. That's or, way actually, later. No, wait, wait. no, no, no. So the Sadducees are the Levitical and then the Pharisees are, um, not, not even necessarily like they don't they're, have to be Levites. Right. No, no, they're not. So, yeah. So with that, I mean, because, well, let's go back, let's go oh, back yeah. to, let's go back way before you're talking about the Roman period. Let's go back what the book of Genesis actually says, if there's any truth, if there's any oh. kernel of truth in there, Abraham meets up with this king Siddiq, who has a priesthood that's mentioned in Psalms that ends up being. I mean, I wonder, maybe we should pull up the text so we can get it right. Do you sure, have I'll, that? It's in, do you know what yeah, you know verse I, it is? Um, well, I, luckily, Safari is pretty easy to navigate. Yeah, so fi let's find that verse and let's see if we could pull a little historical kernel out of it, maybe. I'm not saying that this happened exactly the way it says it is, but if there really was a god named Siddiq and there was a priesthood in the north, you know what I mean? Let's see what it says. Let's see. Because I know it's mentioned in Psalms, too. King of Salem. Okay, yeah. here. Oh, dude. <laughs> you always do that. It's funny. Yeah. What does right, it say? So, let's see. Um, so when this Abraham, is from Genesis 14. Go ahead. Yeah. When, um, uh, when Abraham heard that, um, uh, that, guys, 
can yeah, I'll hear. I'll just read it. I'll just read the, it. Read the English. Don't don't worry yeah, about the Hebrew. Yeah. When Abram heard that his kinsman household had been taken captive, he mustered his retainers. Um, what, what, so the, see, like a word like that, that's actually important to see what it says. Okay, fine. Chanichav, his trained, instructed, trained servant, tried, experienced. Uh, okay, so I just don't want to spend too much on the oh, yeah, 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 Hebrew because yeah. people are going to yeah. be like, huh? Sorry. You know? <laughs> uh, You're good. Yeah. Born into his household, numbering 300 and 18 and went in pursuit as now that's family. specific right there what does that mean that something's being relayed here as far as what's the okay read this one more time i can't really so, see it on your screen let me just see what it says so Born, go back down a little bit i want to see what it says uh when abram when abram heard oh you passed it abram heard that his kingsman had been taken captive. he mustered his retainers born into his household numbering 318 and went to pursuit as far as dan now, where's, so, Melchiz Mel where's Melchizedek coming in to, come to this? Well, so I, I just wanted to give the context because it's below. But Okay, it, keep going. Um, keep going. But, but the thing that's worth mentioning here with Dan, it's probably an instance of the later editor kind of like writing it because the, it's kind of like if you're saying, you, you know, the Native Americans. Well, Native Americans, yeah. any of them didn't call themselves. Like I want to get into Dan in a little bit Let's because that's going to be – you guys got to wait. Dan's inter interesting. Let's keep okay. going. Okay. At night, he and his servants deployed against them and defeated them, and he pursued them as far as Chova, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the possessions. He also brought back his kinsman Lot and his possessions and the woman and the rest of the people. So it's right down here. When he returned from defeating Kedomar, no, yeah, Ka yeah. and, 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 and the kings with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the Valley of Shaveh, which is, I think that might mean the va Valley of uh, Seven, maybe. Seven. No, Seven. that... The, um, the the valley of oh just the valley of plain like that, yeah that's almost a contradiction anyway there it is uh, Melchizedek mm -hmm. of Salem see this is specific Mel King Melchizedek of Salem here so I brought I, I, over I, bread and wine he was a priest of God Most High so he's this is talking about something some sort of priesthood in the land of Salem oh, where is the land of Salem so this is interesting there it, it doesn't say anything inherently about a land of salem but this isn't the land of like now so, is this jerusalem your jerusalem is that what see, they're saying is this that, pre that's pre jerusalem time so that is this what they're getting at maybe that's what they're getting at like the, the what because you could also look at this at, because it's not salem it's shalem yeah in which case it might be connected to uh let's see it might be Jerusalem. Well, the 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 point that I'm trying to bring out here, I, I'd need to look at the um, more of the context, but basically there might be a connection to the um, to to the goddess Shalem, but obviously that that's not the way that's going to be read from you know a Jewish Christian yeah. or Muslim standpoint. Right. So um, what I'm saying is, it's quite possible that when this is getting penned down, I, I'm gonna get some super chats in a second. The so two of them just came out, and then mm -hmm. we'll keep going on this, and we'll get into Dan and stuff like that. That it's possible that this king and priesthood of Siddic is what they're talking about here, where there was an eternal, where there already was a priesthood in place. Maybe this priesthood sort of, you know, gets brought into the fold when Israel starts becoming its own entity. I'm just saying, I'm, not, I'm looking at it from a possibility. I'm not saying that I, I can prove this or anything, but I'm saying is that this might be a possibility of why. This is in because otherwise you have to wonder why are they putting this in the text? It has to be there for some reason. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. Well, so that that's another interesting thing. I think the reason why some people end up interpreting, you know, this character to be divine is because the fact that he blesses Abraham, and some people understand that as well, and this is even before he's called Abraham. So it's he says Abram. he blessed him, yeah. saying, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, literally, um, of El Elyon. Um, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be um, El Elyon, who has delivered your foes into your hand, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And I think what they're doing is, is there? This is, this is, this is looking back at a time when their monotheism wasn't even a thing yet. But what they're doing is they're identifying certain priesthoods that were worshiping their specific gods in their particular lands, and saying. They're all worshiping the one God who's the Most High, El Elyon. I think I think that's what you end up getting with when they're looking back retrospectively of these ancient priesthoods. 
they're basically and you you see this with Christianity too. Christianity early on in the second century was saying, Oh, yeah, all these people that worship Addis and Dionysus and Osiris, they really were worshiping Christ. They just had their own way of getting there. You see that in the heresies and stuff like that. So why not? Why there is an example of that. What I'm saying, maybe we have another example of people in the ancient world when monotheism starts becoming the, the thing. They're saying, yeah, they, they these are these are real righteous people worshiping God in their way, you know. So let's just say they worship the same God as us. Just throwing yeah. it out there. I also think it's interesting here, um, b- given. Oh, so here you have Melkit Sedek, you know, the king, uh, my king is Sedek. Yeah. Then you here have Melech Shalem, the king of Shalem. Right, um, exactly. And then here you have El Elyon. Those are three different. Three different possible- gods in the Canaanite pantheon. No, that's, yeah. a, that's a really good point. That's exactly what I'm getting at. It's like there's something going on there where these these little remnants of polytheism are trickling out of the text. And you can sort of find them if you really look. But hold that thought for one second because we have a couple of super chats. Right. I just want to catch up on these. This is, I, and I definitely want to go back to this. This is super interesting. Lev Polyakov. He is he has a channel called Break the Rules and go and subscribe. He does really good debate and stuff like that. Number one, Moloch, Mo Problems. Number two, is the glorious kingdom of King Solomon based on the Phoenician Empire? I'm going to let you answer that. What do you think about that? That's a good, interesting question. What do you think? So I, I mean, I think that would be really interesting. And based off, I mean, given it's hard to really say anything objectively because there's so much sophistry going on throughout, you know, throughout the ages. But, like, you did have, um, what is it? You, you had, was it Aristobulus? Hiram. Uh, you, Hiram. You, King Hiram? What? Maybe? I thought you were, I thought you were talking about the king of the Phoenicians, oh, Hiram. Oh, no, no. So, so you'll you'll know what I was talking about. But basically, that there's the, um, some Jewish sophists who write about Moses teaching, you know, basically teaching the Greek alphabet to the Greeks. Yeah. But we know, we know that happened from the Phoenicians. So, were they basically that is there, that is Aristobulus, and he says that Moses taught Orpheus the alphabet, and and then Orpheus brought it to the Greeks. Now, that's just that's obviously just a made up story. But what is he what is he trying to say here? Is he trying to say that the, the Phoenician alphabet came from the Jews? Because the Phoenicians are Semitic. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe that's what he's trying to get at. But I know exactly I mean, what you're I, talking I, about. It's in the pseudopigrapha text. Aristotle uh, of Alexandria. I also think it's um plausible because you have like ba- basically what is what is the reason why you have, you know, the this invasion of the quote unquote sea peoples of Canaan because at the end of the day it wasn't necessarily the nicest land in the Mediterranean but um I, I mean it, it was a key you know trading point but if you're just looking for land to settle because society's collapsed it's more important just to find a place where you can settle and where you can you know take care of yourself so um yeah. is it possible that they like kind of like salmon returning to their spawning waters that they returned to their ancestral homeland, but that they'd been gone for so long that they were recognized as foreign or something. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, you know, that's just speculation, but um, I, I do think it's interesting because some of the tribes that are more associated with like uh, warfare or not necessarily warfare, but like movement, actually, yeah, definitely not warfare, but specifically movement and travel and trade. Yeah. That they, they also tend to be almost like, cemented kind of into the tribes but well here's the thing about phoenician when you say phoenician empire what you're really talking about is sort of a confederate empire what i mean by that is loose there's no it's not like a there's no federal centralized kingdom like they're the the sidonians are one entity the tyrians are one entity the carthaginians are one entity but they all are related they're all Phoenician. By the way, the word Phoenician is not what they called themselves. That just means purple people in Greek. And the reason why they called them that, the Greeks called them Phoenician because they sold purple dyes and, and purple clothing because they you know they knew how to uh, extract it from the from the Murex snails. So Phoenician Empire is sort of a loaded term in itself. But I get what he's saying here because they're talking about Semitic peoples coming from the Levant, populating the whole Mediterranean. You know, populating all of all the way to Spain, basically, 
And so they're connected like that, but they're not, they're not on, it's not like the Romans where they're like, oh, we got to, you know, everything goes back to Caesar at the, they don't have a Caesar. They're not like ruled by one king. So it's sort of a confederacy in that sense. And the, so I, I can't, back to what you're saying, it's a loose, it's loose tribes, basically. Makes sense. So thank you for that super chat, love. Appreciate that. Uh, you can, uh, go go ahead. Say, you want to say something on that? Go ahead. Yeah, you could probably make the same argument for like that same loose confederation of tribes of Israel and the loose confederation of tribes or, you know, city states of Phoenicia. Right. Yeah. Because once again, like I said, they don't call themselves Phoenicia. They call themselves Sidonians if they're from Sidon, Tyrians if they're from Tyre. They're called themselves Carthaginians. But they all sort of know, they all know their history. They all know their Semitic peoples from the Levant. They, and so they they sort of, and they trade against each other. They, you know, they help each other out in that sense. But like, yeah, exactly. That's that's a, that's a good way to put it. Well, so. Also, speak, speaking on that, though. Um, oh, shoot. What, wait, what was it that you just said? Sorry. They're all, there's a, it's a loose confederate of confederation of, of, oh. of seafaring peoples that right. they don't. And Phoenician, the word Phoenician is not what they call themselves, is what I said. Well, so this is the interesting thing. It kind of reminds me. Uh, I was talking to my rabbi la uh, last week, and one, one thing that he said, I actually explained to him that technically it, it was ironic, but basically he says, you know, religious, God forbid, we're connected. I'm like, well, technically religious actually comes from religio, you know, from like ligament, like the idea of binding together, of connecting. So, um, but in that, so the, the word Canaanite is actually derived from Kinanu, which it means like purple, uh, it means purple, like you were saying. So really? Phoen Phoenicia, yeah, which, which is the Greek term for the purple dye or like, you know, like the, yeah. the, the color. Phoenicia, yeah. It, yeah, it actually holds the same context, just in different languages. That is interesting. Because that, if that's the case, now we have a connection with Canaan and Phoenicia that's not just based off what the Greeks are calling them. But and that, one of the tribes. That's interesting. I, well, that's dumb. And Dan, I want to get into Dan in a minute because Dan is. I think that Dan comes from Greece. But let's let's hold that thought for a second. Constellation Pegasus, thank you for the super chat. Were the Levites responsible for pushing the Exodus story since they were running the show? That's a really good question, dude. What do you think about that? Honestly, I I mean they're the ones who. No, he's not wrong. The le the. The priestly class is probably in charge of the scribe class too. Probably, just saying. The temple scrolls and all that stuff—that's not too. You're not. You're not getting all that stuff outside of. I mean, you might be. I could be wrong about that. But I think that's a good hypothesis to say that whoever's in charge of the priesthood is probably in charge of the scrolls too, right? I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, I. I, I, I don't just, know for sure. I'm just not commenting because I. I don't feel like I really know enough. Uh, like I. It's a hard I, question. I, I guess maybe you could argue that because there is this one theory that the Levites, and again, not to say that they weren't originally from that land, but that they just got seen as foreign. But th there is this one theory that like their name might have been derived from um, like from an Indo-European root or something that they yeah. might have been one of the like. Also, the the, the capital of the C P or uh, of the Hyksos was named Avaris, which. You know that the the name for right. them before being Israel, the Israelites was the Hebrews. And yeah, I've heard people make that Avar, connection. Ivri or Avar. Yeah, that's interesting. It's definitely interesting. I've heard people make that connection. It's definitely, definitely interesting. Constellation Pegasus is another one. Uh, what's the guest opinion on Genesis teaching a flat Earth and dome cosmology? Ooh, I'm not mentioning a six thousand year Earth. That's not a serious question for me to entertain. <laughs> so well here let me pull this up because um the, so it, it, it's like similar to uh one of the things that uh sentinel apologetics brought up last night was that um uh was it um Shoot, sorry, I lost the train. Oh, right, that uh, when it references uh, that the behemoth eats grass like an ox, that it, um, that it's it, it's using a comparison, but it's also not saying that it isn't an ox. That um, but it, in this case, the the word for firmament here um, is rakia, 
And the reason why it's understood as solid, the only reason is because the um, raka means to beat out as one beats out a bronze shield. And so because of that, it's kind of this idea that you're beating something out over something out, uh, over something else. So there's definitely a context of like a dome, something. You know what's weird about, about that? Out. If you mm -hmm. read the Odyssey, is it the Odyssey or the Iliad? No, the Iliad, I'm sorry. If you read the Iliad, Achilles' shield is described as the cosmology of the of the heavens and the it's like he explains it how his shield depicts the cosmology of the universe it's a shield which go bringing back to what you're saying about this word firmament didn't you say it's connected to the, how the shields are battered yeah that's interesting i wonder if there's anything going on there but go ahead but yeah like at the end of the day i think you could definitely argue they probably thought that it was a solid thing that was separating the waters above from the waters below but I also think that, like, you have to look at it with some continuity. Like, so maybe a curved flat Earth. Well, <laughs> but again, like, um, th there's this idea that people at that time generally had the idea of, you know, like a river surrounding the lands. So, like, they understood that there was an ocean, but, um, and I, 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 th I think they knew that, um, at least, I think the Phoenicians would have known that the world wasn't flat. Literally, it's just being used in poetic illusion because... Yeah, no, we know for sure that there, are, there were Greeks. And I think there was writers in China. That don't quote me on that because I have no idea. But there were people, individuals, who were really smart, who were you know, philosophers and scientists all the time, who knew the world earth, earth was round, but it was not popular opinion yet. So they just kind of got... It, it was a theory at the time. But it was out there. We know that for sure, that the idea of round earth was already thought about way going back to the 4th, 5th century BCE. So, But yeah, uh, let, let's take the other super chats so that we can kind of like finally get into the stuff about the tribes. Sure, sure. Okay, so the next one, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to throw it like this for a second. So we're not, you know, mm -hmm. there's not too many confusing texts on the screen. The next one's from Lev again. Once again, go and find Lev. I, break the rules dot tv i hope i said it right if not just type it in youtube and it'll come up break the rules and then you'll find it on there anyways 12 being the zodiac did they intentionally keep it to this number also curious about dan he's already on what we're already on we're, we're gonna get to this but let's 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 address it he, he you know he paid his super chat also curious about dan and kundalini snake energy cults well that that last part that's a little different than what we're getting at but what do you think about this on honestly I, I think that there's probably some truth to that because you like if you want to follow it, there's the you know which part you talking about the, the first part twelve being the number. Yeah, so so if you look at it, so there's you know Jacob has twelve sons, but the way it's counted, Joseph isn't one of the tribes. He's split into half tribes. So you could argue yes. those half tribes make up one tribe together, but like that that's really stretching it. If you want to go off of it, there's thirteen tribes. And one of them just doesn't have land, but for the it's sake just a of, priesthood. yeah. So, so to make it make sense, they say twelve. But at the end of the day, like it, actually here, I, because I think this is probably a good time to bring this up because it's also one of the older parts of the Bible, at least like grammatically. Even though this is, um, so like this happens after they've already gone into the land of Israel. But um, let's see, what is it? Um, Okay, here. Oh, and this is a re really good place to start. In the days, uh, can you see this? Uh, let me show. Oh, my bad. I got to put it up there. There we go. Okay. All right. All right. In the days of Shamgar Benanat. And one thing that's interesting about this name Shamgar, it means there. Oh, here it's saying Shamgar means a sword. Um, but you, you could also break it down into Sham there and Gar stranger. There I was a stranger. And that, that, that's the same name as Gershom. Just that's, a, that's the thing about Hebrew. It's like it's like a, the, every word is like a Tetris, like of like words un, within itself. Like it's so weird, like that. Sorry, go ahead. Anyway, so the, he's referenced as one of the judges of Israel. You know, one like literally, this is the book of Judges, and so um, Shamgar Ben Anat. Now Anat here it translates as his answer. It says father of Shamgar, but. Sh Anat's not mentioned elsewhere, and because there's no grammar referencing Anat, we don't know whether Anat is male or female. But because mm. Anat 
in that in the context of the ancient Near East was isn't it not a name of one of the gods from the yeah. Canaanite pantheon? Wow, yeah. interesting. So, so you could argue that this might be from a time when that wasn't seen as heretical, and like you have this tradition of being, you know, essentially the 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 child of God, um, yeah. similar to Caesar. Um, but and, and I want to yeah. throw this out there for people who think that by bringing up the polytheism thing that I'm trying to tear down Judaism. Think about it like this. I mean, you have angels and demons that are not equal to God, but they're not humans. They're divine entities. So who's to say that in the polytheistic world, you couldn't have a concept like that. I'm just, I'm just giving you something for yourself to make it easier to take that pill, I guess, if that makes sense, but go ahead. Yeah, that's a, that's the way I look at it because this idea that monotheism is something we need to strive towards. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's it's something that's retroactively imposed onto the past. It it's right. just you know it wasn't a thing then. Yeah. Um, but now should um, I should I just tell him this? Curious about Dan? Hold off on that thought. I want to because we're gonna get into Dan. I don't want to just do it right now because there's a couple of super chats that I want to do first because there's a lot on Dan. The thing about the Kundalini snake energy calls, I have no idea how you would compare that to 12 I, I, tribes. I know. You do know? know? Do you want to just touch on that before we go on? Yeah. So, I mean, you have this idea that the tribe of Dan was establishing like idolatry, um, especially like in the North that they were building like the, the bulls, but um, th there's also probably some idea that they were, you know, associated with some sort of like snake. Work. Honestly, think about Moses like holding up the serpent in the wilderness and it's uh, it's a snake on a rod, and it heals you. Kundalini is basically saying you heal yourself by letting the serpent inside of you rise, right? I'm saying I'm just I'm not a Kundalini expert. I have no idea. I'd love to have someone on explain that stuff to me, but I'm just saying what I think might he might be getting at the serpent thing, right? But no, like the specific difference though, because you could argue that the serpent um, on the staff that it's actually a dragon based off of the way it's depicted. But in the case of, um, in the case of the, the snake of Don, it specifically references either like an adder or a cobra, like a, a snake on the path. Yeah. And Dan is, okay. So if you hold on, a, if you wait a couple minutes for me to get through these next couple of super chats, <laughs> Dan is interesting, dude, because Dan looks like one of the tribes that is mentioned in Homer. Also, when you look at the Egyptian text, one of, um, you showed me this actually. One of the, one of the so-called invaders that comes to Egypt from the lands of Greece and whatever from from the northern Mediterranean. They don't say exactly where. We don't know if it's Crete. We don't know if it's Macedonia. Who knows? They're saying that these sea people invaders coming down, and they name one of them. I'm pretty sure it's Dan. So, so there's a few different names. Uh, one of them is the Danan. Danan, or the, yeah. Or, or, or the Danian. So, okay, so keep that in mind. Then when we look at the Exodus story, and uh, Simka Jacobovici has pointed this out, when the, when the Exodus is going down, Dan gets in their ships and leaves. They have ships. They're seafaring people. So we have a connection between seafaring people and sea people invaders that are going into Egypt. So I think, and by the way, if you look at the 12 tribes map, Dan is on the coast. They're coastal people. They're seafarers. I think we have a direct match between the Danoi and the Dan tribe. That's what I think. We're going to get into that in a second, though. Let me just talk, touch on these other super chats real quick. Vesper, thank you for the super chat. Siddiq appears to be related to Melchizedek and Zadok. I agree. And what I think yeah. is even more interesting about that, Vesper, is when you look at the mythology of Siddiq, he has seven sons who the Neoplaton Middle Platonists equate with the Cabieri of Greece. But then he has an eighth son with a mortal woman and the eighth son his name is Ashmon. Ashmon has is a pun that means oil or a shmon means eight. So Ashmon is the eighth son, shmon, but he's also oils because what happens is Ashmon when he's he's the uh, the goddess Astarte is in love with him, and he can't shake her. So he castrates himself and then bleeds out and dies, just like Addis, by the way. Very similar to Addis. And then when she sees that he's dead, she mourns over him, weeps over him, brings him up into the heavens, heals him and makes him a god, 
brings him back down to earth, and then he becomes the Asclepius of Beirut, according to, according to the Platonists at the time. And they said that he was using oil to heal. That's where you get that pun from. So that's, and that, by the way, that's coming from his father, Siddiq. And so when you talk about Christianity, having a priesthood that Christ is the next Melchizedek, Christ is the anointed one, the oiled one. Just throwing that out there. Maybe there's a connection. Maybe there isn't. Maybe I'm going too far with it. But I think it's interesting when you look at why were the Christians comparing Christ to Melchizedek? And by the way, his Germatria, 888. Yeah. Bam. So and, I'm just um, saying, and I say there might be something there. I'm, I can't prove it, but I can, I can definitely throw all that information out that you make you decide for yourself what you think. Something else that um, I think I told you about this, that it blew my mind when I realized it. That same like typology applies to David. He's the um he, he's the eighth son of Jesse. Um, oh my God! And he's about the, that. you know he's, yeah he, he's the founder so of you know is he really the, the eighth of son of Jesse? Yeah. No you're, way. You're all, I'll pull it. No so, way, but. dude. That is crazy. I forgot about that. You showed me that one time, and I remember saying, "Dude, we got to bring this up on our channel," because that's like the, now we have so many weird connections to eight and oil and by the way king david plays the harp king kinnerus where the mythology that we just talked about with uh ten, with adonis and, uh, and all these other characters who are very similar in their respects to jesus can kinnerus who's the father of adonis i know he's the gra grandfather of adonis i think if i'm not mistaken he's i think he's the grandfather of adonis he plays his name it literally means playing the harp so it's like you got a king who plays the harp I'm just saying, there's a lot of weird connections like that. A lot of weird stuff that you can look at. It's all very loose. You can't. It's hard to put it all together. But like, there's a lot of connections like that where you look at certain details of certain kings playing the harp. That's kind of a specific thing, if you ask me. Oh wow, this is fascinating. So apparently, the Book of Samuel states that Jesse had eight sons, but the Book of Chronicles only named seven. Is he the seventh though, or is he the eighth? Um, well, so so depending on which book you that's what you, I'm saying. But in in Samuel, he's the eighth son, right? Yeah. Okay. Now in Chronicles, it says he has seven sons total. That's including uh, David, or is he saying he had seven sons and then he had David? That's what you got to look up. Either way, uh, either way, yeah. the fact that Samuel has him as the eighth son, that's kind of interesting. Wait, this is saying First Samuel sixteen ten. Uh, let's see, First Samuel sixteen ten. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, that here. Let me get the Hebrew, even though I'm not going to read. Oh wait, next Jesse. Wait. Oh wait, here. Then Jesse called a. a oh wait, here. Sorry. Next Jesse presented Shema, and again he said, "The Lord has not chosen this one either." Thus Jesse presented seven of his sons before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, see? "The Lord." That's not David yet. David's the next one. Yeah, there but you go. Also David is the eighth son. David is the eighth son, period. Yeah, so the Lord has not chosen any of these. Any then, of these. Then Samuel. No, asked, David's from another mother, just like Ashmon. Dude, dude, think about this for a second. Ashmon has seven brothers, half brothers, from Siddiq. But the mother is not the same mother as him. David, exactly the same, has well, seven half brothers from Jesse. From a different mother, but the uh, is it Bathsheba? Is that his mother's name? No, no. So no, they they have the same mother. In fact, the mother isn't even mentioned. I mean, like you could argue maybe they do have different mothers. No, but what? But think about think about what the text says. He no, presents the, seven brother, seven sons to him. He says it's not any of these. Then he brings out another one. Right. No, but it, th there's this idea that you keep your youngest son with you. It, like you can see it reflected in the story of uh, Joseph when he's a vizier of Egypt. How? All right, look, uh, look that up. Look that up. Look up to see who is the same mother of David and who's the mother. His, I know that Jesse has multiple different uh, mother, uh, wives, right? Look nah. into that. Look into that. I mean, let me read the next super chat. All right. Lev brings up a good point. Thank you, Constellation Pegasus, for this super chat. I appreciate you so much. You are literally the best. Love brings up a good point of the Zodiac. Babylon knew 13, but ignored it. Yeah, 12 tribes reminds me of the Zodiac. It's just too similar. I agree 100% on this. And so even the Zodiacal 
even on the zodiacal line, even to the Greeks, you have Ophiuchus standing inside of that line, but they sort of they sort of cut him out to make twelve because twelve is that number you get going back to the Babylonians. Twelve, twelve is the number. It's six. It's based off the sixty, twelve and sixty base counting system. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong about that too. But I'm just saying, I think there's they're making it twelve for a reason. It just fits better. Now, were you able to find out about? Should I go to the next one? Or are you still looking for that? So yeah, I mean, like th- there is a reference in. Um, I think it's in the. Uh, I mean, the, yeah, the the reference to um, to David's mother. It's mostly in. Um, I think the Talmud. But, but the, the point is is that there's no reason to think they had a different mother. The reason was because he was off tending the sh- the flock. That's why he wasn't there. That's why he was separated. But like okay, then, okay. it's not it's not important. But, it's, but, but the, the thing is interesting though. Why you have seven sons who are presented in front of Samuel, and David's not there. He's separated from them. That's interesting, right? I mean, there's something to be said about that. Yeah, he, he's like distinguished from them. Exactly. Now it says in here, it says that the Jewish legend has Nitzavet as the mother, but there's no biblical confirmation of that name. David's father, Jesse, lived in Bethlehem and was from the tribe of Judah. David was the youngest of eight brothers. That's interesting. So, yeah, you might be right. You might be right. It might just be the same mother. Yeah, like it doesn't say, though, doesn't say. The important thing here is that there's eight sons and that the eighth is the one who's anointed, the one who's oiled. and that, that... Exactly, dude. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm getting so excited about this. But it's like, what, how, how is it that you have a, God, a Semitic god named Eshman who's the eighth son and he's the chosen one? And now you have with David very similar. I'm just saying it might, it might, it might, it might be a coincidence. Okay? I'm, I'm throwing that out there. This all could be a coincidence, but I'm going to say, just like Constellation Pegasus is saying here, with the 12, with the number 12 thing, I don't know if it's a coincidence. I don't think you just find 12 randomly. I think you get 12 when you want there to be 12. So that's that's what I'm saying. Lev Polyakov, thank you for the third Super Chat tonight. You're, you're awesome. Dan, connection to Sardania or Danmark. I don't know about all that. That's, yeah. that's a little far, far away. But uh, but the Danoi, because that's the name of the tribe, Danoi. That I think you have something there, especially because they're both seafaring tribes. So I think you can make a case there. When you get when you when you start going all the way to Sardinia and Denmark, we're going far now. But anything's possible. You can't you can't rule it out completely. You know, you just gotta. I don't know. Make make that hypothesis a little stronger if you find some connections. You know. But uh, interesting uh, point. George Coggins, thank you for the super chat. Have you looked into the psychedelic use of acacia in ancient Jewish practices? Rabbi Harry Rosenberg, by the way, I know Rabbi Harry Rosenberg. Uh, I was connected to him. Are you related oh, wow. to him or no? Or is that no, different? I mean, I mean, uh, honestly, maybe. I, I don't know. He's doing much, and he's right. Rabbi Harry Rosenberg is doing a lot of research into this. He knows. Uh, Tobias Singer as well. Oh wow! That was by ch- just by coincidence. My cousin, my cousin's boyfriend knows that's her actual. Oh no, that's his rabbi. It's oh, Harry wow. Rosenberg, and so she introduced me to him, and we were we were we connected. We were planning on making a video at some point, but we both been real busy. But I want to have him on because his work is really interesting, where he points out that the acacia tree. The highest content of DMT in the world is also the same tree that they build the ark with, the ark of the covenant, where these these Jewish priests are going in and getting revelations. What's the manna? What are they doing here? What what are they taking? What's going on? So there's some questions to be said, and this is we're talking about Rabbi Harry Rosberg is a devout Jew. He's not just saying random, you know, heretical stuff. He's making really good points, and yeah. I think that you know people like that I think need a voice because. There's nobody giving it to him, you know? Yeah, it, it, it's fascinating. Um, like, th- there's a lot of precedent for this within, you know, Jewish texts. And, like, w- one of the biggest ones that I was surprised when I was actually looking for references for Mary Magdalene is that Magdala, where Magdalene was from, which was also associated with, you know, 
tower with, with a tower because the name uh, is from Migdal, which means tower. Um, but that's where, um, so th there's a story that when, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, that Jacob had them bring acacia trees and plant them. And then when they left the land of Egypt, they brought those acacia trees with them. And when, um, and then they planted them back in the land of Israel and where they planted them was in Magdala. And that there was this tradition, there was like a prohibition against cutting them down because they were considered sacred because of the, the, um, the you know, the Ark of the Covenant. But, um, but I, I, I'm almost sure that it mentions that like, well, first of all, if it says do not cut them down, that means people were cutting it down. But beyond that, I think there might have actually been references where it says that people were cutting it down. But um, it said that there were three towns um, that were... Here, let me just pull this up because sure. it, it's relevant. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Uh, Magdala. It means the uh, place of the tower, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So... Um, of three, uh, let's see where it is. You know what I think about when I hear Magdala? I think of the tower that's on the Great Mother's head. Oh, yeah. Like, I'll show people what I mean in a second. So, you hear Mary Magdala. Now, there is, now here's the thing, though. You got to, I guess, off the bat, there is a city called Magdala. So, it's not, you can't just say, oh, because her last name means tower, she doesn't exist. And so, no, no, there's a place called Magdala. So, it's not that crazy to say, Mary Magdala can't, you know, that's Mary Magdala. But it's also interesting that I'm talking like myth, like when we're putting this on text now, we're mythologizing history. What I think could be happening is there's a po it's a possible that I'm going to pull it up right now. When you talk about someone whose last name has to do with the tower, you know, why not? You know, that that's that's uh that's the great mother right there. That's so actually that's Artemis. But, uh, but you know. Artemis gets identified with the great mothers at some t in, in some some cases, but still, you see the tower on top of her head. You know, she's like the temple basically. But yeah, just want to point so, that out there. Yeah. So here's what's really interesting. So of three villages was the the Katmos, a and a word for which no reasonable source or meaning is found in the literature. So um, of three villages um, brought this whatever Katmos was to Jerusalem in carts. Kabul, Shikhin, and Magdala of the Dyers. Here it's relating Magdala to dying. And because uh, because it's on the coast of, or on the shore of the Galil, um, the or the, the Kinneret, the um, the Sea of Galilee, they, they don't have the murex snails that were used to produce the the purple and blue dye um, that was used for like priestly garments and stuff. But there was another one, the Shani, which was um, like a, like a bread, uh, sorry, not a bread, a red color. Yeah. And um, acacia is actually used on top of being used for entheogenic purposes. It's also used to produce uh, to produce a red dye. And so oh, that's right. It is. It does. And actually, I'm not. And that's a fact. Like, if you buy acacia root bark, and you want, let's say you're, I don't know, you're making DMT or something. If you spill that, if you spill that stuff on a shirt, you just dyed that shirt. Whether you like it or not, you're not getting it out. It's dyed now. It is very, very powerful red dye. And it's red. It's completely red. It's exactly the same red as you see behind me. It's exa exactly the same. But so what, what's really interesting here, it says all three were destroyed. Kabul because of coral, because they were fighting amongst each other. Shikhin because of sorcery. So, you know, th th probably they were, you know, producing different like potions or whatever. I, who knows? Maybe they were casting spells, whatever it means by sorcery. But here it says, and Magdala of the Dyers because of whoring. So there's two ways you can interpret this. Either it's talking about that, you know, they had like a, you know, a lot of prostitution there. Or it might be using this uh, like metaphorically to refer to whoring against God, which is idol worship. And which doesn't even need to be idol worship, just something that's seen as that. And something as simple as cutting down the trees for use in ritual would be seen as idol worship. Yeah. And so because of that, you could argue that there's that connection there. But hey, we should probably get back onto track. Let's get into Dan. Let's, get, let's finish off with Dan. Because Dan, now we don't know about all these other tribes, but we could look into Dan. We have some information on Dan. Now, can we start with the Egyptian account of the Sea Peoples coming and one of them being called the Danoi? Can we get to that? Do you have that in front of you or no? Uh, you can just explain it if you want. 
Uh, here, let me see if I can just find, uh, it should have the source for it on, let's see, uh, Ganyan. Yeah, I know you also have mentioned in Homer, a tribe called the Danoi up in the north. There's a seafaring tribe, too, in there, too. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, wow, this is fascinating. So, um, let's see, the, the Danyan is reported to be one of the groups constituting the Sea Peoples. Uh, they're mentioned in the Marna letters from the 14th century BC as being possibly related to the land of Danuna near Ugarit. So that would support the evidence that they were a sea oh, I'm people. sorry, I wasn't sharing it. Go ahead. Oh, um, th th this would support evidence that they were like, you know. Now, finished. what does it say that, what does it say about them being a sea people? Because you have this in Homer, but what does it say there? So, no, the, so uh, possibly being related to the land of the Danuna near Ugarit. So Ugarit is in modern day Phoenicia, or, or sorry, modern right. day Syria. Uh, and then the Egyptians described them as sea peoples. So they're already a Levantine type of, they're already coming out of the Levant in that sense. So you would, you kind of would see how they would get lumped into these tribes if they're already from there. You know what I mean? Now, now here's the thing where there's a text in Exodus, I believe, that talks about Dan leaving, getting in their ships and leaving. Just kind of neglecting the the rest of them. Do you you know what text I'm talking about? Here, let me see if I can find it. So, yeah, I think it's in um, Exodus. Let's see, you said Exodus. Um, let's see. Here, let, let me see if I can um, filter for. Uh, oh, chronological, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we go. Here we go. I found it. Yeah. As, as, wait, is it Judges? Maybe. Oh, I could oh. be wrong. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so it's Gilead tarried beyond the Jordan, and Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Asher remained at the sea coast and tarried at his landings. Dan, yeah, exactly. So which, which verse is this now? Judges 517? Uh, yeah. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the clans of Reuben, there was great indecision. Gilead remained by the Jordan. Dan... Why did you linger by the ships? Asher stayed at the coast and remained in the harbors. Zebulon was a people who risked their lives. Naphtali too. So Dan's getting getting sort of singled out as leaving everybody behind when they're in trouble and just going back to their ships and doing their own thing and forgetting about everything. That's interesting because we have Dan being connected with ships. We have a seafaring. I think we have a seafaring tribe. And then you look at look at the pull up the twelve tribes map real quick. You have that. I know you do. Where's Dan at? Uh, so they, they right have... there. They have the port of Joppa, the biggest port of Israel, the biggest seaport in the entire land is in Dan. Who who else who else would be in charge of the biggest trading port in the whole area? If they're not a seafaring tribe on the coast, right? Also also, another thing that's kind of interesting is that Zebulun is the one that's associated specifically with ships, but they don't actually have a, a seaport. And then, yeah, they're not even on the coast. So I'm I'm thinking Dan is the seafaring tribe connected to the sea peoples via via you know the just through through the what the text actually says, taking the text what it says, you know. But Dan's yeah. always connected to the ships, always. So something that I did want to bring up, though, is that the um, like the mothers of Israel, like the four mothers, um, or you know the mothers of the tribes of Israel. You have four. Um, was it uh, R Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah, and they're all from Haran, which is um, prob. Th this is an interesting thing because Haran was associated with idolatry, but more specifically with like. Um, was it like the worship of the heavens or like this um, kind of what, what becomes later like hermetic philosophy, like this idea of like the seven spheres or whatever. Um, yeah. And so basically they're, they're coming from there um, and, you know, you have four different mothers and, oh yeah, that's right. I, I uh, let's see children here. Um, can, can you see this? Uh, yeah. So, here you um the numbering is the birth order, but it has them by their mothers. So here you have uh, Leah's children: Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. So if we look on the map, um, Issachar and Zebulun are together, 
And then uh, you have Reuben, Judah, Levi doesn't have any territory, and Simeon's here. So you have the bottom here and here. So that that that's Leah's area. Then you have um, Dan and Asher from, or wait, no, it's um, Gad and Asher uh, from, uh, I forget whose handmaid. You have Naphtali and, uh, actually, wait, I have it here. Um, uh, so Gad and Asher are from Zilpah, Dan and Naphtali uh, are from Bila, and then Joseph and Benjamin from Rachel. But um, mm, Interesting. Um, but yeah, so here, uh, now who's the, Billa? Where's Billa come from? So she, she was, a. um, oh yeah, here, uh, oh, oh, I just found this too. So that, that's the song of Deborah where you get the Dan yeah. staying in their ships and, and, uh, holding back and it oh, says, right. um, yeah. go ahead. Oh Sorry. yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's what we're reading before, but then we got, uh, sidetracked. So that was the thing about Shamgar. So in the days of Shamgar, yeah. son of Anat. In the days of Yael, who's the one who killed uh, Sisera with the uh, peg to the temple, caravan ceased, and uh, wayfarers went by roundabout paths. Deliverance ceased, ceased in Israel till you arose, O Deborah, arise, O mother in Israel. Uh, when they chose new gods, was there a fighter in um, in the gates? How is this translating it? Um, there was war in the gates. Uh, there a fighter in the uh, uh, No shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with Israel's leaders, with the dedicated of the people. Bless the Lord. Uh, here, I'm going to skip to the relevant part. Well, here's... Uh, 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 real, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Finish that off. I'm gonna, I have something interesting. You got to you gotta hear okay. this. All right. Uh, then was the remnant made victory over the mighty. The Lord's people won my victory over the warriors. From Ephraim came those who root, uh, whose roots are in Amalek. So interesting. That, that, that I, I would need to look more into that because there's... Because you have the uh, Amalekites. They're a totally different thing. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, but, but you check this out, right? Mm -hmm. So the book of Revelation, when it lists the 12 tribes, Ephraim and Dan are not listed. And so oh. when you go back to Genesis 49, Dan, it says Dan shall achieve justice for his kindred. Uh, let Dan be a serpent by the roadside, a horned viper by the path that bites the horse's heel so that the rider tumbles backward. And so this particular verse, Irenaeus and Hippolytus both say that the Antichrist will come out of Dan. Dan gets separated from the tribes according to the Christians. Revelation, Hippolytus, Irenaeus, they don't like Dan. They think Dan's bad. Dan is the symbol of the snake, the serpent, the viper, and that's where the Antichrist is going to come out of. Oh, that to me is pretty mind-blowing. And t touching on that, um, actually recently, w one of the like big conspiracy theory conventions or whatever, they've been having this like, uh, like Marvel style, like, you know, good guys versus bad guys. And they have the Holy Bible is like the, the totem for the good guys. And then they have the snake of Dan as the symbol for the bad guys. So it's like, you can right. see it alive and well today. Yeah, there you go. There you go. But yeah, so one, one interesting thing about this that I, I really think is worth pointing out. Dan shall govern his people as, or literally like one of the tribes of Israel. Why does it need to say that he's like one of the tribes? Yeah, that's a good, that's your, I'm glad you spotted that in the Hebrew because that's what it says. But Why? that's a good point. Why would it say that? Dan it, shall be a serpent by the land. That's exactly what I just read. So it, it, that's a really weird thing to say about Dan. And I think the Christians picked up on this and the writer of Revelation picked up on this. And the, the heresiologist picked up on this, and they said Dan is not one of the real tribes. And so you cut Dan out. Now you can get back to your number 12. Oh, wow. Okay, this is interesting because in the in saying backwards, it's also a play on words because Ahor can also be ach, like it can also – I think it can also mean like literally like the, like an ass, like, like, like a donkey. But Oh, really? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. But but it is interesting because you know within this you have this context that like the scale scale is also tying to the idea that they'll get into in a bit about that it, they also might be referencing the constellations. But if like if Dan is both a judge and a serpent, it's kind of this idea that the scales that there's good and bad, and that the serpent is good well, and well, bad. Well, think about this scales. One of the ah. one of the images of Dan 
is hold on a second where where did it go hold on i gotta uh hold on a second one of the images of dan is the image of uh basically the um libra scale i, I don't know why i can't get it to pop up I'm gonna, hold on give me one second I'll, I'll show it to you but that's one of the so there's images of the 12 tribes and on one and some some of the some of the cases you get dan as a snake other times you get dan is a libra scale have you seen that before yeah Sometimes you, can, you even have it, it up combined, like like a snake coiling around the scale. Oh, I can just share my screen. That's what I can do. So here, I'll just do this because it's not for some reason it's not like saving in my images for whatever reason. But uh, here it is. There's your Dan D. None Libra scale. You know what I mean? So you have some people depicting, and so that's why it says Dan will be, you know, giving justice to the nation. What does it say again? Something like along those lines. Go up. You go up a little bit. So, so th this is the interesting thing. So, Don, Don, um, Don Yadin. That means Dan will judge. But it's Dan will judge. Person. The word Dan means judge. Yeah. So that's why it's Don Yadin. Yeah, Dan. Don the Daniel. word Danielle is judge of God. Daniel, you know. So there right. you go, and that that's what the book of Judges in Hebrew is, Danin. So you have Dan as the judge. It's so confusing. It's so weird, isn't it? It's just there's yeah. so many, so many outs, so many different connections and uh, you know interpretations of this stuff. So, so I think we brought it back but, full yeah, circle. I, I think one thing that is relevant mentioning though is the fact that the mothers or you know the wives of Jacob are from Haran. That they you know they're they're familiar with the constellations and like you know they like that's literally part of the religion in Haran. And so it's no no surprise that there is going to possibly be this connection that they they, they like whether you view this from a historic historiographical perspective like you know people trying to make the stories of their people fit together or whether you view this as like literally as the Bible says you can still view it as they knew about the Mazalot which is a part of you know Jewish and Christian uh, tradition and um, basically that it, it has a role that like it doesn't contradict anything that's in the bible it, it just supports it but what, one thing that i think is interesting though is that once you start looking at all of them you can see it in a whole new light so um let's see uh so let's see where is it um so when rachel saw that she had born jacob no children she became wait wait sorry where is this uh wait oh Sorry, this this was the story of Dan. It's a bit further. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, wait. It should be down. So, sorry. I'll. Um. You you go ahead. Uh, is there any more super chats in the meantime? I clicked on the wrong thing. I got clicked out for a second. Do you hear me? Oh yeah yeah. Okay. So what are you find? What are you looking for right now? Uh, I'm trying to find, let's see, Genesis 2932, was it? 2932. Uh, okay. Seeing that Leah was unloved, Yahweh, the Lord, opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuven, for she declared, it means uh, the Lord has seen my affliction. Or uh, from Ra'ah, because Reuven is like Ra'ah Beni. He has seen and like yeah, you know, Reuben. I thought Reuben means seer, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so there's a few different etymologies for that. But yeah. what, what's interesting, and here I'm going to bring it up. But uh, also in a seer yeah. of a sense of someone who can see prophecies, stuff like that. A Reuben. Interesting, and that's also kind of connected with um, what I think he's connected to, like zodiacal wise. So um, the uh, let's see, where is it? Um, what one? Oh, wait, I have to do it by chronological here. Um, oh, wait, no, it's in. Okay, here. Here it is. So um, th this is the prophecy that, or the blessing that Jacob gives to his sons. And Jacob called his sons and said, come together that I may tell you what is to befall you in the days to come. Assemble and hearken, O sons of Jacob, hearken to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and first fruit of my vigor, exceeding in rank and exceeding in honor. Unstable as water, you shall excel no longer. 
for when you mounted your father's bed, you brought disgrace, my couch he mounted. So in this, um, it, it's worth noting that compared to the other ones, this is ex, ex, um, explicably not, and like it, it doesn't use animal analogies. This one doesn't. So in that you could maybe assume that here it's relating him to a man, you know, also saying the firstborn, the firstborn of his fruits and, you know, his being Jacob and Jacob's a man. So it, it, anyway, the, the relevant thing is unstable is water. And you can actually read, uh, let's see, commentary. Um, it, it talks about here. Sorry, I have to scroll through a bit. Um, oh, wow. Uh, okay, here. Here I found it. Um, let's see. Um, oh, no, sorry. I was looking at the wrong one. That's why I wasn't finding anything. Sometimes it's kind of hard to navigate Safari. Yeah. Um, especially because I'm zoomed in. Sure. Okay, here. Um, wait, what? Uh, yeah, you have any commentary on the meantime? No, I'm. Uh, that's pretty much all I got right now. I mean, uh, if you want to finish off with this, yeah, that'd be cool. All right, so um, let's see. Um, I could have sworn I saw it. basically um, whatever I found before it connected it with like pouring out water. Okay, wait, is this maybe here? Oh, as far as someone's saying they got timed out, I don't. I didn't see anyone get timed out. So just so you know, I was just. I just saw that now. I didn't see anything like that happen. Um, okay. Well, I I can't find exactly what I was actually here. Let me zoom out. That might make it easier to find it. Um. Oh wait, it was. <sighs> sorry about this. Okay. Sorry. Right. Sorry. Right. Uh. Let's see. Um. Oh, wait, I could just search for water. That would be easier. <laughs> no, what are you exactly are you looking for? Um, okay. So Ibn Ezra on Genesis 49, 4, 2. Have thou not the excellency? Some say that Al-Totar, have thou not the excellency, means you will not have the advantage. However, if this were the case, then our text should have read Al-Totar rather than Al-Totar. Wait, okay. Others say that our clause should be interpreted thus. You acted unstably as water that is poured out of a vessel, and you gained nothing thereby. That, um, so like there's, uh, let's see, basically it's relating him to water and water that's being poured out of the vessel. I think who was getting related to water? Ruben. Oh, really? Interesting. And so I think, I think in that you could argue that he represents Aquarius. I then, see what you're getting at now. Now, do you think that, do you think there's evidence? Cause I, I've always looked into this before people try to connect the 12 tribes with the 12 constellations. Yeah. You have 12 and there's 12. But when you start looking at which one means what, there's the symbols aren't the same. But you mentioned here Ruben might be connected with water. Okay, we got that one. Do we have a clear connection with any other any other of these tribes? Because I know that there's a lot of arguments you can be made. Like Dan looks like the Libra scale in some of the depictions. Also, there's Dan looking like a serpent. But like what I'm saying is. You can get a lot of interpretations out of this. It's not clear cut from what I'm, you know, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, d definitely. Even like the paradigm I'm trying to make it fit, it doesn't fit, uh, fit, eh, it doesn't fit clearly. But the thing is, it fits so, like, it fits enough that makes me think that probably. It, um, you can that, probably like, argue that the, tw the two tribes that come out of Joseph are like Gemini, basically. If you actually, if you did, if you I, wanted to, I'm not saying that's the case, but you can I almost actually, make that argument. I actually found another one to make it fit. So if you look at, um, so Simeon and Levi, they're, they're referenced in it as one in the prophecy. Shimon and Levi are a pair. Their weapons are tools of lawlessness. Let not my person be included in their council. Let not my being be counted in their assembly. For when they, for when angry, they slay a man. And when pleased, they maim an ox. So that's when they're angry, they kill men. And when they're pleased, they, sa they you know, they sacrifice for food. Uh, cursed be their anger so fierce and their wrath so relentless. I will divide them in Jacob, scatter them in Israel. So this is why they both lose their birthright, as does Reuben, because he mounted his father's couch, which mm. he, he he had um, he had an affair with uh, the hands uh, maid servant of uh, I forget if it was his mother or um, his aunt, but 
So, so here they, they lose their birthright because of this. Here it's saying they're a pair or they're brothers. So I would connect that to Teomim. So, so um, also, so Aquarius in Hebrew is Dali. It means like the servant or like manservant. Um, Teomim is um, twins. That, that, then you, so that those, the, the, that'd be the second and the third um, sons are counted as one. Then you have Judah. Uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Wait, is this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh, wait, is this the part where it calls? And okay. don't forget, the, yeah. the Babylonian star catalogs and the Egyptian star catalogs are not the same as the Greek. They're very similar, but there's, there might be some differences. And we'll, we'll explain why we get, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. Like, we're operating in an ancient setting where things might be a little different. So w one thing that you mentioned before that is just so fascinating and, like, I mean, I'll just need to read this and see what you think of this. It talks about, uh, let's see. Oh, here. It was, I was looking at the right one. So um, here, I just need to scroll down. Okay, here. Uh, choice fine. Okay, Ibn Ezra. Similarly, and his vesture in the blood. So here it says, he tethers his ass to a vine. His ass is full to a choice vine. He washes his garment. In so this is about Judah, by the way. Um, he washes his garment in wine, his robe in blood of grapes. So right. here, here it says, and his vesture in the blood of grapes. Some say that suto, his vesture, is the word kesuto. Uh, with, here, uh, the, the meaning of this verse is that his vineyards will produce so many grapes that Judah will bind his foal to the vine, and he will not care if the animal eats of the grapes. And he, uh, let's see, is there... Um, okay, but what does that have to equate to? Because isn't Judah obviously depicted as a lion, right? He, yeah, so th th this part's more so referencing the kingship. Um, okay, here, or he will launder his garments in wine in order to, oh, wait, no, that's, uh, there was one thing that I read. I'm not sure <laughs> if I can find it right now, but it talks about, just uh, explain it, just explain yeah. it. You don't have to okay. find it. Uh, basically it's relating it to the, um, the purple of the blood of grapes that basically it's that they're dying the clothes, the robes in that, that, um, like, so he washes his garment in wine. That they're literally dying the clothes and wine. Sure, purple. That's royal, royal purple. That's what it's saying. I, I get what you're getting at. Yeah, um, that royal purple. So then, uh, does it mention here that he's? Yeah, Judah is a lion's whelp. So here you have Leo. Um, and so then, so yeah. yeah. So you have some clear ones. But basically, what, I, what the reason I brought that up, so you have some that look clear, like you have okay, Judah, that's Leo. Oh, uh, maybe Dan. There's the uh, you know. Dan's a judge or Libra. Once you get past like three or four of them that look like they're pretty clear, the rest of them are like, you don't have much to go off. So you just, you're just kind of playing, you're looking for, it's, it's like you got to dig and try to find a connection. So it'd be interesting if we can put something together at some point of the best possible hypothesis of do the 12 tribes equate to the 12 constellations. I have oh. never seen one done yet that, that's very convincing. But I'm interested to see what we can do maybe going forward, you know? But yeah, like if you if you look at Zebulun, here it says, Zebulun shall dwell by the seashore. He shall be a haven for ships, and his flank shall rest on Sidon. So the, I think the key things here, you could look at that Zebulun. Pisces, maybe. I don't know. Aquari like you uh, mentioned I, Aquarius. I, I'd say I'd say Cancer because crabs dwell on the seashore. Like they literally yeah, live see, in the that, you can You can say that too. It's just not as clear cut as you want it to be. It's very open for interpretation, is what I'm getting at. Definitely. And then with something like Issachar, um, it, um, which here it's actually interesting because it references something that I think can show that they were probably originally sea peoples. So it says Issachar is a strong boned ass crouching among the sheepfolds. When he saw how good was security and how pleasant was the country, he bent his shoulder to the burden and became a toiling serf. So rather than being a wanderer, he sits down and works the land or like um, uh, studies in uh, d depending on the tradition. But um, yeah, I think you could argue that probably it would be a donkey, but there isn't a donkey in the modern Zodiac. Right. So, now, what is Sagittarius again? I forgot what that it looks like. That's some sort so of. Well. So Sagittarius, that's the um, the archer, right? Yeah, but it has like a it's it's a. Um... It's a uh, centaur. Kentaur, yeah. So it has yeah. like the legs of what maybe you might say it's a donkey legs, but you know, because horses and donkey legs are not that 
you know, they're not the same, but I'm just, I'm just saying like somebody might interpret that way. Somebody might say that, try to pull that off and say, so, maybe, maybe Isaac is a, is a Kentar donkey. So there, there's a better fit for that. But so, um, so if you go, so Don, well, also just, just for context. So um, the, was it? So uh, Judah, so Leo is Arye in Hebrew, then Zebulun or um, what well, cancer would be Sartan. Uh, then wait, was this next? Oh yeah. Issachar uh, or if, if it, yeah, I, I don't really know what Issachar would be, but then. Yeah. So on- that, and that's what I'm saying. You, examples like that, where once we start getting into, there's too many, like you could, you can also, if you had, if we had enough that were clear cut, we can do the thing where, okay. Um, tr- uh, what's left is like, um, what, what's the phrase they call it? Trial like by elimination, process, basically. Process of elimination. Process of elimination. But uh-huh. you, there's so many that are open that are so vague that you just can't. You just you just end up make. You just end up fitting, putting things where you want to fit them. So when it comes to when it comes to the twelve tribes of the constellations, being the twelve uh, um, tribes, I don't see a direct c- connection in that sense. Other than there's twelve. That's what I- I'm getting at. I, I don't know. You, you might change your mind when when you see some of them because the way that they get translated, it doesn't seem that way. But if you translate it literally, it starts to make a bit more sense. Except yeah. for except for those two. So here you have uh, God Gadud Yigudenu. Uh, God will be raided by raiders, but he shall raid at their heels. Um, in this, the, um, there it you could argue maybe it's Aries because even within the name God, there's like a double meaning because Gadi means goat. And on top of that, th- this concept of like rackishness and you know Aries being warish. Yeah, but think about um, it. Let's let's. Um, and I'm not I'm not saying you're, that's not a bad interpretation, but is it is it like is it a slam dunk? You know, Gad is Aries. Like, is it is it like so clear that we we can't ignore it? Like, I I don't think so. I I mean, Gad is literally being described as the warish tribe. Yeah. It's also it's also the word for, I mean, sure, sure. But um, then you go to Asher. Asher's bread will be rich, Virgo, um, and and he shall yield royal dainties. Like Asher's associated with the harvest. And um, that's a good things, one. That's a good one. one. I like one that of the one. things that's really interesting here, though, is uh, and he will provide royal delicacies. Yaakov does not imply that the land that Asher. Oh wait, hold, no. Oh wait, here's where it was. And he will provide the king with taxes in the form of oil. It was this oil that was used to anoint Jewish kings from the tribe of Yehuda, as this was not necessary after David had been crowned, or, uh, or not, yeah, and his dynasty had inherited automatically by the successor. So basically here it's saying that the oil was produced from Asher. And he, here it says Asher's bread will be rich, but literally, me Asher from Asher, shemena lachmo, his bread shall be oiled or oily. Mm. Um, so that's probably Virgo. Then you have Naphtali is a hind let loose, which yields lovely fawns. You could argue, I mean, given it's not a perfect parallel, but the idea of like, you know, essentially a, a horned, um, a horned animal let loose. Capricorn. Capricorn. That, yeah. That's what I, think. I like, uh, I get what you're getting at. I get what you're getting at. I think there's something to be said there. It's just, it's, I wish it was a little more clear. I, I don't think they were putting too much weight into that. When they're making their 12 tribe, I don't think they're trying to make 12 equal 12. I think they're just kind of putting in 12 and making the number 12 fit rather than exactly equating each one. Cause I think it gets a little bit, uh, gets a little vague after, but I, I see what you're getting at and you might be honest something. It'd be interesting to put it together and put it all into one spot instead of trying to like dig through all the text. That would be, we, we can, we can put this on the side for that. It'd be interesting. There is a super chat though. Unless okay. I know, I know you might have more, and I'll let, I'll let you say it. Let me just get the super chat. Constellation Pegasus, thank you again. You've been great tonight. You've been helping me out so much. Can't can't express how much you know how happy I am to see you here. Zodiac and astrology is silliness. Signs back then are different now. Thought I was a Libra all my life, but the sign has changed. <laughs> Some astrology sites have mixes of old and the new dates. It's all nonsense. Now, what's interesting about this point, though, Augustus, they say Augustus was born in September, right? September 23rd, they said his birthday was. But he was, he was, uh, his mother was pregnant for 10 months, according to Suetonius. 
Cicero says that you got your birth, you got your uh, star, you got your star uh, map or whatever. You got your zodiac based on the not the time you were born, but the time you were conceived. So if you go 10 months back from December 23rd, you're in December 25th area for, and by the way, well, I'm, not, I'm not just making this up. Augustus was a Capricorn. It's on his coins. Capricorn is December 23rd to January whatever. So Augustus was born around the winter winter solstice time. That's kind of crazy you think about. And but but the reason why I even said that is because you're right. These signs get all mixed up and changed and different dates and different interpretations. It's very very hard to make a solid solid interpretation of this stuff. Very very hard. I agree. Thank you for that super chat. But yeah, the, the, the next thing, I think that th this is really interesting because of how it gets translated. So um, th there's a few different translations for this. Let me see if I can actually find that. Yeah, translations. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just tell you the translation. One of them is Joseph is a fruitful vine. Um, mm. But here it says Joseph is a wild ass. So there's two different translations that are given. But if you read it literally... Ben Parat, Yosef Ben Parat. So Ben Parat means son of the Parat, or Parat means the Para, like in the context of Ben Parat. What does that mean, though, in English? So, so it could, um, it comes from the root Para to bear fruit, be fruitful. Oh, um, I see. But here it's also Para. Para Aduma is the red heifer. Para is a heifer. Or so he could be now. Taurus, maybe, is what you're saying. Yeah, but not only that. So Joseph has two <laughs> tribes, though. So here it's saying Joseph is a wild ass, a wild ass by a spring. Why? Um, here it says, you know, wild colts on a hillside. Archers bitterly assailed him. They shot at him, harried him, yet his bow stayed taut, and his arms were made firm by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. There the shepherd, the rock of Israel. So there it's saying wow. that Joseph is both a bull and an archer. So that means he could be he could be Sagittarius. Sagittarius has a bow in his hand. And yeah. Taurus. Both. So there, and that, and that's the thing. Sometimes, sometimes you look at them, they look vague. Sometimes you look at them, they look equal. Like uh, Judah being the lion, Aries all day, or uh, um, uh, Ju Judah the lion all day. But Ariel, I guess that was the reason why I said Ari yeah. Ariel means lion in Hebrew. But my brain got all mixed up. Anyways, Judah being the lion seems pretty, pretty, you know, pretty easy to go with. But then you start coming on the other side, you get these interpretations it could be either or it could be two of them could, and then some of them you just have no idea like for example um of the 12 tribes i don't know which one is uh where, where's the list of the 12 tribes let me see i mean there's some that you just don't even know at all right if i'm not mistaken and you have to go with basically canceling out the other ones to get to there right like what what, do you, what would you say I'm like, let me throw one out, Jay, and see if you can you can list it. Let's go with uh, let's go with Levi. What would you say Levi is? So Levi with Simeon would be the twins because they're referred. So you would to have to bring those two together into one tribe, though. But see, that's a thing. Like at the end of the day, like if you're trying, I think that if you're trying to read it, like is Levi and Simeon both from, they're both born from Leah? Okay. And now in the text, are they both twins or no? So they're not twins, but they, they, like, in the context of their relation, they are. Yeah. Okay. Like, um, no, that's fine. I'm just, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not trying to catch you or anything. I'm actually, I want to see where some of these stand. Now, we said Dan probably looks like it might be the judge, right? You said, uh, well, so interesting thing here, though, in the way that it describes him as both a judge and as serpent. a viper, yeah, I think you could argue that he actually represents both Libra and Scorpio. But here's the thing: once you start bringing two into each of them, then what do we? Then we're, now it's even harder than we imagine, don't you think? Maybe See, there's the, different interpretations of these things. That's all I'm I, saying. Oh, a hundred percent. But like, I mean, with this paradigm, I think it would be wrong to try and force all twelve of them to fit yes. into all twelve constellations. I agree. Because, because like what we were talking about before. Um, here where, um, th this is in the song of Deborah, it, it lists the different tribes that are involved from Ephraim came those whose roots are in Amalek after you, your kin, Benjamin from Machir. Machir is one of the grandsons of Jacob. 
or uh, sorry, Joseph. Yeah. Uh, from Mahir came down leaders from Zebulun, such as hold the marshal staff. And that's referring to like a staff of leadership, which is connected to like being the leader of the tribe. And Issachar's tribes uh, chiefs were with Deborah. As Barak, so was Issachar, rushing after him into the valley. Among the clans of Ruven were great decisions of heart. Why then did you stay among the sheepfolds and listen as they piped for the flocks? Among the clans of Ruven were great searchings of heart. Gilead, so here Gilead and Machir, they're named as tribes in a way that they aren't in the Hebrew Bible or the rest of the Hebrew Bible. Gilead tarried beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Asher remained at the seacoast and tarried at his landings. Zebulun is a people that mocked at death. Naphtali at, on the open heights. Then the kings came. They fought. The kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh by Megiddo's waters. They got no spoil of silver. And like you can look down the rest of it. There is no mention of um, Judah, no mention of Levi, no mention of, I think it was Simeon. So like, yeah, like given it, it's not a cohesive narrative. But I think it's more so that you have this idea that there's like 12 constellations, that they represent different stuff. It was, it was mainly for agricultural purposes more than anything. Like you even have this tradition that the constellations don't have an impact over like humans, that it's primarily over like plants and animals and like material things um, or things that aren't viewed to have like, you know, full souls or like souls or whatever. But um, I, I think the thing that's important here is to realize that the form of the zodiac that we have is the one that was passed down through, you know, the Greek tradition through um, through the Hellenistic world. And so to to take that as superimposing this, which was arguably either maybe not written before, but like it it goes back to a time, at least to an oral tradition prior to the existence of the Hellenistic zodiac. Because the, the Jews actually were in contact with the Zodiac prior to the Hellenistic world. And so I really think you could argue that maybe, yeah. like, at the end of the day, because, you know, you can go to a different, like, another continent, and they'll have different associations with that Zodiac, but they still have the same, you know, same signs yeah. in the sky. They just view them differently. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's a good point. Um, we will close up on that because I do got to get going soon. Actually, oh. I do got to get going right now. But... Oh. Any last thoughts? I'm going to bring up your channel so everyone could see it. And I want everyone to go subscribe to Ariel's channel. Uh, oh, let's yeah. see. Let's pull that. Just... Go ahead. Say One what you last say. thing. That... Yeah. Um, if you could just share what's on screen right now. Oh, sure. And th this is a perfect, uh, you know, uh, was it transition yeah, yeah, yeah. to the next video. So this is the blessing with which Moses, God's agent, bade the Israelites farewell before he died. He said, the Lord came from Sinai and shone upon them from Seir. And then here it implies God, but it's just, you know, some something appeared from Mount Haran and approached from Ribevot Kodesh. And uh one, one second. Yeah, you got a lot of you got a lot of noise going on. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. We're we're done anyway. We're done. Wait, so um yeah, so uh so here, Ribevot Kodesh, it might be the myriad the holy myriads, which gets uh related to like the, the letters in the Torah. But here it says, it translates as lightning flashing at them from God's right. But here it literally says, um, eshtat, which gets translated as fiery law, lightning, something like that. But um, the theory is, because it's a hapax legomenon, it only appears once in the Hebrew Bible, that it's actually, um, that there was, um, it was slightly edited to basically appear uh, angled rather than curved for the dalid and for the toff to connect the bottom parts of the top basically making it a toff from a hay. It, it's, I don't know how well accepted it is, but basically that it was referencing uh, Asherah at the right hand of God. Wow, and that, that's, that's interesting. In context of I think we're going to have a whole discussion on Asherah next time we do the next time we go live. because that yeah. Asherah yeah. is just, somehow they try to delete her out and we can find her in the text. There's ways to do it. Yeah. We'll have a whole episode on that. The woman with the sun and the moon and the crown of stars. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's what we'll do on Friday, actually. We'll talk about that. We'll get into Revelation and stuff like that. Almond will be here, too. But cool. uh, go and subscribe to Asherah's Orchard with Ariel Rosenberg. And, uh, you know, show show Ariel some love. Thank you for the coming on tonight, dude. Anything, anything else you want to say about your channel or anything? Um, Not particularly. I'm just, as always, I'm glad to have this opportunity to share what knowledge I've managed to get. And, again, like... It, seriously, did not even start looking into the stuff before, you know, we started having these back and forth because it's like there's so much that I just would never think to.
look at, but then I hear it's like, oh, wait, this sounds super familiar. So then I look into it and find something. Yeah, for sure. So today yeah. is Monday. And tomorrow night, I'm, I'm going live. I'm actually doing something interesting. I'm actually going to be uh, discuss- talking with Derek and Richard Carrier. Ooh. And uh, just going to, you know, just, you know, putting the bridge back up and, you know, stuff like that. And nothing, not like there's no debate happening. No, you know, just explaining my my position, why I made the video. And then Carrier wants to give a little response. And then uh, that's it. We're going to leave it at that. And we're going to, um, you know, stop all try to try to show by example, because there's a lot of people on Facebook right now that are going at each other's throats over mythicism and historicism. And there's no need for all that. So um, we're just going to have a quick discussion. I told Derek I would. And, uh, when, you know, it won't be that long probably either, but it'll be just to show people like, look, we I don't dis- I don't agree with you about what your hypothesis is at all. You know, I, I you know, I hold to what I said in the video very much, but uh, we can be civil, you know, stuff like that. So. That's what we're going to do tomorrow night. Just something that's just, that's all. Oh, this is super chat, by the way. Oh, yeah. I also wanted to address that. Sure. Um, go ahead. Say, say what you had to say. Yeah. So at the end of the day, like the Jewish zodiac that we have is, is um, it's very close to the Greek, if not like exactly. It's just you have Hebrew names for them. And like you, you, you can see, um, I think it's in the, um, the thumbnail for this video that it has the Hebrew names for it. So like, um, like there are Hebrew names for it. The thing is that whether the Greek was derived from the one that the Hebrews were using, and then we just call the one that we use Greek, even though, you know, it was used by, like, at the end of the day, it wasn't even a Greek zodiac. It comes from Babylon, and they just changed it to fit, you know, the Mediterranean. Yeah, that's definitely true. And Vesper, I think you got a good point there. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. And don't, don't, you can't remember, don't forget about the Septuagint. That's an ancient text. It goes back. It's not a new text. It's an ancient text. So, you know, that's always in play. So, but that being said, you have ascertained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over.